All right. I know it's been a little bit. Uh, been like busier than can be. <laughs> uh, so keeping up with stuff, keep up with orders, not really. And like been learning a ton of new stuff as far as like how turbochargers work and how they work separately from the engine. Like there's there's two ways you have to look at them at the same time. You have to like look at like what the charger is doing by itself, like what the motor is doing by itself, and then look at how the two are affecting one another and how to get them to work together better, right? Kind of you, you establish baseline and then after you have like the baseline, go back and see what changes the system wants. So I've been working with quite a few people with compound setups on getting the drive to boost in check through looking at what the turbos are doing in their state right so that's more cages more pressure sensors uh, and seeing what's going on looking at uh, mainly it's all exhaust stuff looking at the expansion ratio on the exhaust side looking at uh, estimated you know basically shaft work produced and seeing how to get them to do what we want them to do. A lot of cool stuff, really technical. Um, a lot of videos have been on turbochargers recently. And the question they get all the time, right, is uh, miles per gallon. Does the turbochargers increase miles per gallon? Does it reduce miles per gallon? How do I get better miles per gallon with a existing setup? Are my miles per gallon good? Are they bad? And there hasn't really been a great, I don't think I've come across, I mean, I guess I haven't really like looked for a video about what miles per gallon is. Um, but at the same time, I haven't like, I haven't come across my feed while looking for informative stuff to listen to at work on YouTube. That goes over kind of what miles per gallon is in a way that comes across that's understandable, uh, like relatable. So I thought I would do a video on miles per gallon. So like what miles per gallon is, how to uh, quantify and break down what your miles per gallon is and how to look at making it better and what things in the system will probably have the best return on investment when it comes to getting better miles per gallon. <laughs> um, there's an upper limit, right? Uh, there's not really a lower limit in diesels. They can tell you just melt the piston, right? And then the upper limit is basically the thermal efficiency with the fuel, how much cylinder pressure can be produced with X weight being injected, right? There's an upper upper limit to that. So the, the lower limit is the motor's dead. The upper, upper limit is uh, physics. I can't, can't, can't beat it. So I think at this point we'll go to the paper and get going. This is going to be long. I was hoping it's going to be short, but this ended up being like three or four pages worth of stuff. And I'm probably going to figure out things to talk about while going over these things on the paper. So let's move to that. All right. So excuse my handwriting or don't. Don't bother me either way. Uh, I don't make money writing stuff down. Um, but diesels and miles per gallon. How to quantify miles per gallon. Fuel consumed by volume over a distance, right? That's miles per gallon. What's funny is we can rewrite this. Fuel consumed by weight over a distance. Now, if you've watched any of my videos, oh, I like fuel consumed by weight. Do a lot of cool stuff with that equation. And if we change it to here, this is all going to start to come together. All right, so fuel consumed by weight is also um, inside the power produced equation, right? Inside torque or horsepower or whatever one you want to use because you can get either one as long as you have a rpm torque is cylinder pressure or force horsepower is torque combined with rpm right so torque combined with speed of motion um, repetition of force applied speed at which repetition of force is applied gives you horsepower so you can have horsepower rpm get torque you can have torque rpm get horsepower right they just go back and forth but if we want to look at um break this down and make it easy we're just going to look at torque. How much torque does it take to move whatever thing you're moving for one hour over 60 miles? Because it's going to keep things easy. Way to break down what 
Moss Crown is. Moss Crown is fuel mask assumed to produce torque cylinder pressure required to maintain current speed, given we are looking at this steady state. So, make this, oh shoot. All right, to make this really easy, we're going to do this steady state because we're doing uh, factoring in acceleration, deceleration, and times that aren't in derivatives of 30 or 20. Uh, it gets a little bit more complicated. We're trying to make this easy because I want you to be able to do it. Because from there, you might be able to figure out what your next step is. <clears throat> Keep things easy. We'll drive steady state for an hour. Without a trailer, we are netting 18 miles per gallon in our diesel. And uh, so we're doing 60 miles per hour, right? Making this really easy. That's 3.3 .3 gallons of diesel. Diesel weighs 7.1 pounds a gallon. That's 23.64 pounds, right? So you would take 60 divided by 18. That's 3.3, 3.3 gallons times 7.1 pounds per one gallon. 23.46 pounds of diesel in an hour. Next, we can look at estimated produced torque. Now, this is estimated average produced torque. So, say <laughs> this does not take into account accelerating from the gas station and then decelerating time and all that fun stuff, right? But let's just say we put fuel in it. We're instantly at 60 miles an hour. We drove 60 miles an hour for an hour. Then we instantly stopped and we noted what the miles per hour. If the brake specific fuel consumption ratio is 0.3, diesels are really, really efficient especially at like low load uh, conditions. And that's 23.64 divided by 0.3. So, and that is 78 foot pounds of torque average to move whatever this vehicle is at 60 miles an hour for an hour, All right? We produce an average of 78 foot pounds. So based on our rig setup, shape, injection system, and losses, both thermal, pumping, friction, everything else, that's what we, that's what's required. That's what our motor has to produce with these scenarios. Then at 18 miles a gallon, right? So now we're going to add a trailer. Going through this kind of fast. Can we see it? Nothing is heavy enough. With the trailer, we're getting 12 miles per gallon, right? Same exact vehicle. We didn't change nothing. But we got more drag, more weight, um, more resistance to movement. So it's going to take more torque to maintain 60 miles an hour. So 60 divided by 12 is 5 gallons times 0.71, or times 7.1 is 35.5 pounds divided by 0.3. Uh, yes, this is going to change because the cylinder conditions change, but we're trying to keep this simple. Uh, it's 118.3 pounds foot of torque steady state to maintain 60 miles an hour uh, with this load for an hour. So we see that as the weight and all the resistances went up, it takes more torque to do the same uh, condition. So... Where does the turbo play a role in this on a diesel? Its main loss is in the pumping losses and in cylinder EGR, artificial, right? So as drive pressure goes up, you can end up with artificially created in cylinder EGR. This is exactly what your BGT turbo does. That's the main reason it's on there is so one, they can get drive above the intake so they can EGR through the intake side as well as it's a really great way to control the amount of CO2 and other things left in the chamber um, through jacking up the exhaust pressure. So the main reason it exists is so you can do this on purpose. Uh, but in our case, let's say we're not using a VGT, uh, created by drive pressure. So at face value, the answer that is, uh, so the face value answer that is far too often misconstrued is the idea that lowering drive pressure is this magic miles per gallon or bigger charge pipes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of a sudden fixes our miles per gallon. Here's the deal, right? The OEM has accounted for the engine to be ran in this environment. And as such, the cam timing cylinder head and all that fun stuff has been engineered so that inside that environment, it minimizes artificial EGR. Now, what you can't account for is pumping losses. We can look at, take a look at pumping losses and how to quantify pumping losses like a way to view them is like an exhaust brake. The difference between that 
uh, being that when a exhaust brake is on, there is usually very little fuel injection, positive torque occurring to counteract it. So from Cummins, I will stick this in there real fast. This this is probably, I don't know if it's way off or accurate as far as, say, an exhaust brake on a 94. Um, but let's just look at the butterfly valve exhaust brake. I've driven those with the drive pressure gauges that they come with to tune them. They're usually around like 60 to 120 PSI. Uh, on Cummins' website, it shows 15 kilowatts per liter is what a butterfly brake is good for. I'm assuming up at these pressures is what we're getting because they work pretty dang good when you got a lot of drive pressure like that. So on a 5.9 liter engine, that's uh, 15 kilowatts times 5.9 is 88.5 kilowatts. Kilowatts, the horsepower is 118.68 horsepower. Uh, at, uh, and we have to add in an RPM constraint because, because it's a, like a negative brake. You can't use the horsepower equation super, like it's not very straightforward because as this number got lower, the amount of braking force would go up, but we all know that that's not really how it works with the butterfly brakes or any of the exhaust style brakes. Usually they need more RPM to work. <clears throat> uh, so I chose a higher RPM just to kind of do this example, maybe a little bit more justice. So if we have 118.68 horsepower with a braking, uh, 2200 RPM, that's 283.3 foot pounds worth of braking force, right? So <clears throat> If the drive pressure is a 120 PSI above boost pressure, or I think a better way to look at this is just drive pressure in general. If drive pressure is at 120 PSI, <clears throat> even if boost is at 120, uh, you would still technically be um, operating like in this environment, right? So that's your pumping estimated pumping loss at that condition if drive pressure is that high. The only difference being is while producing power, you have positive torque, a uh, large injection cycle that's offsetting that by quite a large amount, right? But that's what kind of like how dry pressure works for as far as pumping losses go. Next part. So that seems like drive pressure is the enemy and a turbo with less drive pressure is the answer, right? That solves everything. Why? But you now the next question is, how come when we put a turbo on with less drive pressure, our miles per gallon doesn't change a whole lot, right? We're not talking some magical number that's worth, you know, $1,500 or $3,000. The problem is that in general, your steady state drive to boost and drive isolated are usually pretty good. The OEM has a large incentive to make those numbers as good as they can be within the laws they must follow, right? So they have laws. You are all aware, all the stuff they got to do to get these things out. We are all, for the most part, fairly aware of how good the miles per gallon can be when uh, people get rid of that part on their own. Right, they go up quite a bit, so it's a it, it the fact that you can get rid of you know that part once you own the rig, and all of a sudden the miles per gallon goes up by like 10. The motor is very well designed to run in this state, so by cha by making changes to this state. For most modern diesel engines, the RO, the return on investment is generally fairly small. Most turbo changes on EFI diesels have a host of other mods that are the main miles per gallon increase, you know, like all that stuff we're supposed to talk about. It's all those things, and then, but because usually the turbo is either the cool part or the loud part or the fun part, it usually gets most the credit when it shouldn't, right? Getting rid of this stuff. Uh, tends to do most of the trick. Larger turbos require less aggressive driving to run clean. Now, whether the computer does this on its own with an EFI system because it's running based off of a uh, virtual AFR, it automatically <laughs> lets you use less average torque while driving, and it will artificially increase your miles per gallon. Smaller or faster spooling turbos allow for more aggressive driving while running clean, sorry, train went by. <clears throat> Smaller, faster spooling turbochargers allow for more aggressive driving while remaining 
cool and clean, right? So you can be, you can't inject more fuel on average with a more uh, efficient or faster spooling setup and leave stoplights faster, go tow faster up hills, stuff like that. So they tend to get a bad rap, not because of the drive to boost ratio, but because of their ability to allow you to drive in a certain manner without feeling bad about it if you're one of those people. Uh, I think it's a good idea that on the street you should try and always do this. Um, so like I said, a computer will automatically do this stuff. It'll allow you to do this. And then on the old mechanical stuff, it's more of a conscious decision to drive either one of these ways. What increases miles per gallon the most? or kills it the most. Targeted tuning and or proper injector selection, which is a pressure deal, to reduce the brake specific fuel consumption ratio number have the largest impact on increases in fuel in miles per gallon. So on, on newer vehicles uh, with common rail injection system, this really too, isn't too big of a problem, but the tuning is a massive one generally in timing and injector on time right or you have your the goal is your 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 a lot of stuff um you know, you're targeting 1800 rpms with a with a 100 foot pound or with 10,000 pounds whatever it takes to move that two mile an hour uh condition and you're and you're trying to tune for that now most tuners right are are not so much after that now a lot of your your uh electronic tuners that you just can pick from levels, you know, the basic stuff, the edge stuff, they got the Moss Brown mode. They are more along the lines of trying to do this versus I don't know what in the world's going on with custom tunes, good or bad, right? Not saying good or bad. Uh, I would imagine though that a lot of custom tunes are geared around making power because that's what owners ask for and not this part as much. Now they have an incentive to make this part good because that can sell stuff just like the OEMs, uh, but I don't know how much they do, right? It's not my deal, I'm not in there. On uh, mechanical injection systems, your injection pressure is a very, very massive part to your miles per gallon. Going too big on the injector kills injection pressure when you're at a steady state loaded condition, right? Um, because injection pressure is a factor of both displaced volume of the pump and engine speed versus the restrictor, the injector. So as the injector gets bigger, but you're not putting more fuel in, the pressure goes down. And when the pressure goes down, that affects the brake specific number, right? It pushes it up. So instead of uh, whatever the pounds was divided by 0.3, now it's whatever the pounds is divided by 0.38. So we just lost miles per gallon right there through the bigger injector. So it's important to keep in mind that if miles per gallon is an important thing, we're trying to make it better. Um, probably the biggest change that will make that better or worse is the injector both its quality and its restricted size as well as tuning the timing is really important the best timing for horsepower on a mechanical truck is typically not the best timing for miles per gallon uh, because that's two different rpm ranges that we're looking at this is why your rotary pumps your ve and bp 44s do exceptionally well here because they have variable timing while the p pumps tend to suffer through having to choose what timing area you want to pick from to make really really good and then there's other things inside the pump that you can do as well that's going kind of beyond the task of what this video is supposed to be about so it's this uh, targeted tuning and targeted size injector for uh, optimum <clears throat> oh all right and then uh, for the best miles per gallon then optimum rpm for best miles per gallon right the rpm thing is an interesting one uh, i noticed this myself on my car it is not a diesel car it's a gasoline car but I've also gone over this quite a bit with other people, right? The general idea is that the less RPM you run steady state, the better the miles per gallon is going to be. And that is typically true unless the load in the higher gear requires more, so much more fuel injected per event to maintain the torque needed. Because as the gear goes up, right, it takes more torque in sixth gear to do 60 miles an hour than it does in fifth gear to do 60 miles an hour. So if the torque requirement, so which is your fuel delivered by weight, exceeds the reduction in total injection cycles, then you get worse miles per gallon. So um, 
that's when I consider, right? So less RPM doesn't always equal better miles per gallon. Um, we've seen this with 12 valves, right? They get kind of the best miles per gallon, typically between like 1,800 and 2,000-ish. Um, less than that tends to require more throttle position. Um, more than that, the injection cycles per minute get too high. It's the same with my little red car. Uh, six, at 60 miles an hour, and in fifth gear, it's 3,000 RPMs, and I get 30, uh, 33 miles to the gallon. And in sixth gear at uh, 60 miles an hour, it's around 2,400 RPMs, and I get around 27 miles to the gallon, right? So it's, it's less injection cycles per minute, but it's a bigger quantity to maintain torque. And now for the last part, this applies to spark condition engines as well. <laughs> uh, the only difference being um, it's a little bit harder for some people to adjust because of it being electronic and they need to be pretty dang correct or the motor dies versus a diesel. It just runs poorly. Um, so I'll do this. Uh, I, I don't drive an hour to work, but we're just going to extend this out to an hour. I do drive 60 miles an hour. 91 octane. Uh, it's a light car. Uh, it's a little red uh, two-door um, uh, Mercedes Benz that I got for like 1300 bucks, <laughs> mainly for miles per gallon. It's going to drive an hour both ways. Um, this is not accounting, starting, stopping, traffic, all this stuff, right? We're just looking at what it's done on average. So we'll go. I go mostly, mostly down. That's uh, mostly a down, uh, going down a grade, going to work, and it's mostly going uphill going back home. So I get 33 miles to the gallon coming to work and I get 28 miles per gallon going home. Uh, 91 octane is about 6.3 pounds per gallon. Um, so 60 divided by 33, 60 divided by 28. Over here. I get 1.18 uh, gallons at 33 miles to the gallon and it takes 2.14 gallons at 28 miles to the gallon. Uh, times the weight per gallon, uh, 6.3 pounds is 11.4 pounds for this one and 13.5 pounds for this one. It's 30.48. We're just going to round up. So I'll take that uh, spark ignition motor. I am sure it has some sort of light lean burn strategy built into it due to it running on higher octane and all that fun jazz that got to run in the thing. But for kicks, we do know that most spark ignition motors, um, we can use 0.5 to 0.45 and stuff like that uh, for light load where they're not under, it might even be better than this. I don't know. It's just an example. So 11.4 divided by 0.45 is 25 foot pounds. Average torque produced to maintain 60 miles an hour and drive down here. And it's at 13.5 pounds to drive home. That's 30 foot pounds uh, average to drive home, right? So that would explain why my miles per gallon are what they are. And if I wanted to make this better on this gasoline engine, I would probably require either tuning or to make it more aerodynamic or you know, reduce drag. Um, increasing the power output on these things on, on gas engines isn't quite as straightforward as what it is on diesel because on diesel we can just go ahead and make the combustion event more efficient. Let's go back to the first page. Oh, I think it's on. Now on diesels, this guy here is almost solely controlled by the tuning and the injector. So this is going to be the main thing that makes a massive difference in your miles per gallon. This is what you should focus on. And just keep in mind that the injector has to get bigger to make more power, but as the injector gets larger, on mechanical setups, its ability to steady state efficiently will be reduced. Um, it's not new knowledge, not new news, but it's something to consider when you're doing this. You know, your tow rig, it might, you might be better off having a race rig and a dedicated tow rig instead of having them do both when it comes to mechanical injection because of, of this scenario. For a lot of P-Pump owners, VE stuff's a little bit different, but they're still at the bane or the, what do you call it, the detriment. I've been a mechanically injected system. The injector is still extremely important and will control 
uh, to most accounts on on average. So if you, uh, yeah, so um, the turbocharger typically isn't any more um, the thing with miles per gallon. Uh, back with the IDI days and things like that, and maybe the maybe the first gens, but I still think that's kind of debatable. It was helpful. Uh, I think one of the probably the biggest contributors to kind of bouncing all this stuff out is one modern turbo technology, and two, pretty much all of these things have intercoolers on now. So charger speeds are all kind of in check. You're not having to design the turbocharger to run in a non-intercooled environment, which means uh, typically higher higher rotor speeds, actually lower rotor speeds. Yeah, um, that's a weird one. Do that another time. The intercooler increases the draw rate through the turbocharger. So the speed increases. Uh, but just modern systems are pretty efficient. And the main reason they are they go inefficient is usually due to owner created problems. Um, low quality injectors, low quality injection pump components, timing without knowing where the pump's actually at. So just pop in the pump. And there's nothing wrong with this at all. You could do whatever you want, you own it. Uh, but timing without knowing where the pump's actually at, you know, when we try and troubleshoot things, I'm like, what's the timing? You're like, oh, I stuck a, a thing on the dampener and popped the gear loose, moved it, and torqued it back up. I'm like, that's great. Don't really know where it's at. We're doing a, we're doing whack-a-mole here with the timing. Um, it works, it does work. It, it might take you a, a handful of times to get there, but it works. Uh, measuring it uh, simplifies it. It cuts the amount of time, and the tools aren't too bad. Oh, but I think that covers everything on miles per gallon. How to deduce it and look at the system. Um, remember, if like if steady state condition or drive to boost is fine, and they're not out of this world, and your miles per gallon isn't what it should be, that leaves the fuel system right. So it's either in the tune-up. In the or it's in the injector or it's in the injection pump that's causing problems with the miles per gallon and that's kind of all there is to it there's not really anything else left to change um, be realistic tire size shape of the vehicle right uh, bricks aren't very aerodynamic uh, second gens are like half of a brick uh, first gen full brick four by fours a lot of drag underneath those things plus all the extra weight uh, your gear ratio, tire size, don't know if I said that or not. Um, all those things play a role. And just remember, it's not necessarily like the lowest RPM or the highest RPM that gets the best miles per gallon. It's the average of injection cycles per minute versus torque produced or torque required based off of load that sets up where the best miles per gallon spot's going to be. Um, and that'll change whether you're always on a hill, always going downhill, always flat. Um, it's going to move around. So, hope you guys enjoyed this one. Uh, you all have a good day. Thank you.